Greetings and welcome back, gentles and ladies, men, to the final installment of the Dreamcast Era Sonic Marathon. I'm X Paradigm Gamer, and it's time to get some remake or rebreak action up in this bitch. I am, of course, talking about Sonic Adventure and Sonic Adventure 2 for Dreamcast, GameCube, and 7th Gen systems. These enhanced ports presented Sega and Sonic Team with the opportunity to update these games and increase their lasting appeal. How well did they actually do this? Let's find out. Before I get into the video proper, I'd like to clarify something one final time so that there isn't any confusion. In contrast with most episodes of Remake or Rebreak, this video will focus primarily on differences between the Dreamcast, GameCube, and digital versions of both Sonic Adventure 1 and 2, though I will be offering my final impressions of the Dreamcast era at the end of this video. If you're looking for my detailed thoughts on either of these games, you'll want to watch the review videos I posted previously. You can find them in the Dreamcast era Sonic Marathon playlist. Once again, I elected to separate the reviews and the version differences into separate videos because integrating them with the main reviews would have saddled you guys with a pair of 50 minute long videos. And I personally would never want to watch a single review that is that long, unless if it comes from a content creator I really, really like. With that out of the way, let's kick things off by looking at Sonic Adventure. This game was originally released as a Japanese launch title for the Sega Dreamcast in 1998, though the 1999 international version was the more complete version that is considered the official one. The game was later re-released for the Nintendo GameCube in 2003 under the title Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut. This is the version most people have played, but in light of the recent backlash against Sonic Adventure in general, many fans have been quick to deny it as a half-assed glitchy port that pales in comparison to the Dream Dreamcast original, but as quick as fans are to harp on the GameCube re-release, they've been even less forthcoming with the final version, a 2010 digital re-release for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC. Now that I've sat down and played all three versions of Sonic Adventure, are fans right to dismiss the enhanced re-releases as trashy, glitchy ports? How will the Sonic Adventure DX and its digital re-release update the original Sonic Adventure experience for newer generations of hardware? This is Sonic Adventure Remake or Rebreak. Let's start first by talking about the aesthetics. Sonic Adventure was a nice looking launch title for the Sega Dreamcast, but there was certainly room for improvement in a re-release. While the GameCube port does improve the graphics from the original game, it doesn't improve things as much as it could have. As for what was improved, some of the assets have been rebuilt from scratch. Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy return to the GameCube with fancy new character models. And while the lighting does make them look like they're made out of plastic, these new models still look a lot better than the originals. Some of the level geometry and texturing has also been touched up to look a little more realistic, and because of the GameCube's better hardware, DX has a much better texture draw distance than the Dreamcast version. While this is nice and all, most of the ugliest assets from the original game have not seen any improvement. Big, Gamma, Zero, and Perfect Chaos still lug around the same jaggy, dated models they had back in 1998. Even Dr. Eggman, the most poorly modeled, textured, and animated character in the original game no less, has seen no visual improvement whatsoever. Why? If Sonic Team was going to bother redoing some of the assets from the original game, why didn't they invest their time in assets that actually needed an update? I appreciate the improvements we did get, but I can't help but feel that Sonic Team kind of half-assed things from a visual standpoint. That same disappointment applies to the presentation as well. I wasn't expecting Sonic Team to remake the cutscenes or re-record the dialogue from scratch, but I was kind of hoping they'd bother to lip-sync the English dialogue. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. The lip-sync looks just as awkward as it did back in 1998. I'm willing to accept that development and budgetary constraints made English lip-syncing impossible for the original Dreamcast release, but what exactly was this game's excuse? Regardless, there are some improvements to the presentation that are worth mentioning. One thing that annoyed the hell out of me in the original Dreamcast version was that every time a character spoke a single line, the game had to load it, and thus the disc reader made a bunch of loud, distracting noises. For one reason or another, the GameCube version doesn't have this problem, and I appreciate that. Additionally, the load times are also a hell of a lot quicker. By far one of the biggest improvements to Director's Cut as a whole, however, is the addition of one simple feature. You can skip the cutscenes. Praise be to Hylia. That may not sound like much to some people, but having to play the Dreamcast version without this feature is something I will never do again. One of the biggest complaints I listed in the Sonic Adventure review was that the cutscene to gameplay ratio was nowhere close to balanced. If you weren't watching Dr. Eggman take the Chaos Emeralds from the Flicky and seeing Gamma fight Sonic and Tails for the fourth fucking time, you were sitting through over five minutes of cutscenes while playing as Amy or Gamma. After 11 years of playing this game, having to sit through six different overlapping stories 
stories just to replay this game once makes revisiting Sonic Adventure something of a chore. Quite frankly, this story just isn't interesting enough to hold my attention anymore, and that's become increasingly apparent to me with every repeat playthrough. For that reason, the fact that I can skip cutscenes whenever I want is a major improvement that makes Sonic Adventure that much more enjoyable to me. Beyond the changes to the graphics and presentation, DX Director's Cut changes a few other things in terms of main gameplay. One thing that I've learned from a commenter named Turnabout Gaming is that the Dreamcast controller has a much better analog stick than the GameCube did. The GameCube only allows you to move in 8 directions, whereas the Dreamcast offers full 360 degree analog control. I tested both versions of the game with this knowledge in mind, and I've concluded that the Dreamcast version does indeed have slightly better control than the GameCube version. Nonetheless, the difference is not significant. It's not something I ever would have noticed if someone hadn't told me to look for it. Another change is that the GameCube version introduces dual analog support, and it's ass. Instead of allowing you to just enable it in the main options menu, the game forces you to turn it on from the game menu every single time you enter a new map. And of course, there's no option for inverted and normal controls. Honestly, at this point, I'm so accustomed to the triggers that I don't see the point of bothering with the C-Stick. A final change to the main gameplay is the addition of a map system to hub worlds. If you ever get lost and need to know where to go, in the Mystic Jungle for example, you can pull up the map to help you figure out where to go. For newer players trying to figure out where to go, this is a godsend and something fans of the Dreamcast version always seem to forget about. And unfortunately, that's about it. If you were hoping to see Amy's acceleration get fixed or for Big's fishing control and camera angles to stop sucking so bad, then you'll be disappointed to know that they haven't seen any improvement at all. In terms of side quests and extras, DX Director's Cut makes some considerable additions. You might remember that the original was the first Sonic game to introduce emblems, which you got for clearing missions in a stage. For every 20 or so emblems you earn in the GameCube version, you'll unlock a nifty Game Gear title in the minigames menu. Honestly, if I ever do review these games, it'll probably be through DX Director's Cut. It even supports progressive scan. The only thing is, you have to collect quite a few emblems to get some of these games, and not all of them are good. Nonetheless, it's still a nice added incentive beyond the Metal Sonic skin to go after the emblems. The other major addition to Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut is an all-new mission mode. Where to start with this one? Basically, you run around the hub worlds as your character of choice and search every cranny and nook until you find one of these little placards. Collecting one will unlock one of 60 missions, which you complete by going to a specific stage or hub and fulfilling the designated objective. For example, one mission requires you to farm a bunch of rings and then take them to this blatant product placement right here. There's a comprehensive status screen for all 60 missions, complete with the descriptions you found in the placards, meaning that keeping track of what you've done and what you need to do is never a hassle. For every 20 or so missions you complete, you'll unlock another Game Gear game for your collection, so you won't go empty-handed. So, would I consider Mission Mode a worthwhile addition to DX Director's Cut? Well, it's okay, but I think Sonic Team really should have spent their development time updating things from the original game that really needed it. Between the Chow Garden and the A, B, and C missions for each stage, I never considered Sonic Adventure to be at a shortage of content. Nevertheless, Mission Mode is still a neat distraction from the main game if you're bored of the main adventure and want to do something different. Most of the missions are relatively simple to complete and make good use of the character's unique abilities. It also gives you an incentive to explore the hub worlds in greater detail. Regardless, I do have my complaints with mission mode. For one thing, I wish that the mission descriptions could be a little clearer about which stage you're supposed to go to complete the mission. Most of the time, it's pretty obvious, but many times it's not. Some of the descriptions are written in pretty awful English, too. My favorite is this one. A fugitive have escaped from the jail of burning hell. Find the fugitive. My second complaint is that some characters have way more missions than others. Sonic has over 20 missions, while all the other characters only have about 5 or 8, which is still too many for big, but I digress. It would also be helpful if each character's missions were individually numbered, so you'd be more informed about when you're done, but the game elects to jumble them all into a single numbering scheme instead. My final complaint is that some mission placards only seem to appear in the hub world once you've cleared certain other missions, which means that you're going to be scurrying all over the 300 hub worlds multiple times as all six characters trying to figure out what you could have possibly missed. I don't understand why all the mission placards couldn't just have been available right from the start, or why we even need to run around and collect placards for that matter. Overall though, mission mode is a decent addition to the GameCube port that's there for those who are interested. So remake or rebreak, how will the Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut attempt to recreate and build upon the original? Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut gets a remake score from me, and is my preferred version for revisiting this Dreamcast 
classic. Some of the character models and graphics have been updated, there's a brand new mission mode that's pretty decent, and there's a host of unlockable Game Gear games that incentivizes going after emblems and completing missions. But what really sells this as the better version for me is the ability to skip the repetitive cutscenes. On the technical side of things, the GameCube version has better texture draw distance, and the disc reading is less distracting during cutscenes. Unfortunately, I feel like Director's Cut falls short of becoming the definitive Sonic Adventure experience for the ages. The lip syncing still doesn't match the English dialogue, a host of dated looking character models are left completely untouched, Amy's acceleration is still off, and Big's fishing still controls like shit. Sonic Adventure DX Director's Cut is definitely superior to the Dreamcast original, but it fails to go the full 9 yards and make Sonic Adventure a more timeless experience. That being said, you're probably wondering if the digital version released in 2010 for PC, PSN, and XBLA is any better. For the most part, it's a competent porting of an older PC release of DX Director's Cut, but I still find it unbelievably half-assed. The same dated character models from the original Dreamcast game have still not been touched up, and there's still no English lip-syncing. Another thing that sucks is that the game doesn't include the extras added in the GameCube version. You have to purchase them separately as DLC. My greatest complaint, though, is the lack of HD widescreen. This game was released in 2010 for HD capable systems. There is absolutely no reason why this game should still be in 4x3. While the image does look crisper than it did before, it really doesn't look that much better than it did on Dreamcast or GameCube in progressive scan mode. At least in those versions, the game actually took up the whole screen. Why is there so much unused space on the top and bottom? They couldn't have had the option to scale it to full screen? What's with this hideous, tacky border? It looks like an episode of Game Mavericks. Shut up, lady. I'm sorry, but I can't rate this game higher than a remake. For what it's worth, the game is very playable and is worth the cheap price of admission if you're interested in the game and have nothing else to play it on. Nonetheless, I'm severely disappointed that Sega and Sonic Team didn't put more effort into this port to finally fix the things that were wrong with the original game and transform it from a dated product of its time into something more timeless. The fact that it doesn't even have HD widescreen basically kills the one thing it might have had going for it. Before I move on to the second game, I want to clarify a major misconception a lot of people have about the different versions of Sonic Adventure, the glitch factor. When a certain animator turns Let's Player showcased a certain glitch in Emerald Coast in his not Let's Play of Sonic Adventure, fans of the game rushed to their keyboards to tell him that it was because he was playing the inferior DX port, and that if he were playing the superior Dreamcast version, it never would have happened. And they're partially correct. I spent about half an hour total messing around in this loop-de-loop -loop in the Dreamcast, GameCube, and PSN versions of this title. From this, I can conclude that the wall clipping glitch is not in the Dreamcast version. I tried my damnedest to trigger it, and I couldn't make it happen. I was able to trigger it in the GameCube version and the PSN version, but I really had to go out of my way to make it happen. I had to stop in place and deliberately mess around with the collision detection before I was able to fall through this loop-de-loop. -loop. On the other hand, this loop-de-loop -loop can still be problematic even in the Dreamcast. Dreamcast version. If you jump or spin dash during the scripted sequence, you will very likely clip through the geometry and die. But again, you'd have to deliberately use these moves to activate the glitch. What I'm saying is that these glitches can hardly be that offensive if you have to intentionally go out of your way to activate them. Not unlike a certain Sonic Boom glitch that's apparently the worst thing ever. I'm convinced that Aaron knew about this loop-de-loop -loop and practiced breaking it beforehand so he could make the game look bad. Because he's a troll to the Sonic fandom and that's the kind of stuff that he does. Unlike most of the people who claim the Dreamcast version is relatively glitch-free, or who claim that the GameCube and digital versions have broken controls, poor collision detection, and glitches up the wazoo, I've actually played all three versions of this game from start to finish. I kept a careful mental record of the relative glitchiness of each version, and after some lengthy deliberation, I failed to reject the null hypothesis. One version of Sonic Adventure is not significantly more or less glitchy than another version. Even if I perhaps experienced more technical hiccups in my GameCube playthrough, it was all stuff that can also happen in the other versions, so it's entirely coincidental. If you are still convinced that the Dreamcast version is less glitchy, then you're going to have to prove it, because I am not seeing what you're seeing. If one version of Sonic Adventure is not significantly more or less glitchy than another, then why are so many people convinced that the opposite is true? Honestly, I think these people either haven't played the Dreamcast version, or are just misremembering what it's like. Perhaps they played it back in 1999, sold their Dreamcast later 
later down the line, played the GameCube or digital ports many years later, and found that the game was glitchier than they remembered it. Since they didn't remember the Dreamcast version being that way, they conclude that it must be a shitty porting job that's to blame, not the original game. Another possible explanation is wishful thinking. People who defend Sonic Adventure need something to fall back on when naysayers invoke the glitch factor. And since not many people own a Dreamcast, or that version of the game for that matter, it makes for a convenient excuse. Whether any of these hypotheses are true, I can't say for sure. What I can say is that if fans of Sonic Adventure are merely looking to defend this game against people who invoke the glitch card, I think you can take comfort in the fact that this game really isn't that glitchy to begin with. Sure, there are a handful of well-known ones, and a couple of minor ones like this one with Big, but you either have to go out of your way to trigger them, or they're completely harmless. All you have to do to avoid Aaron's mishaps in Emerald Coast is to hold up on the control stick and not touch any of the buttons. That must be fairly intuitive, seeing as most of the people who played this game know that that's what you're supposed to do. People also need to explain to me why it is that when Bethesda releases half-finished open world RPGs with an abundance of game-breaking glitches, they're the bestest games of all time. But when Sonic Adventure has one glitchy loop-de-loop, -loop, it's the worstest Sonic game of all time. But EPG, Elder Scrolls and Fallout are actually good. So you're saying that glitchiness is okay when you like the game to begin with, but when you don't like the game, it's bad? Sounds like some selective reasoning to me. Bottom line, the issue of technical problems in Sonic Adventure has been greatly exaggerated. That being said, let's move on to Sonic Adventure 2. SA2 was the last first party release for the Sega Dreamcast, hitting shelves worldwide in June of 2001. Seeing as the Dreamcast died around the same time, the game was quickly ported to the GameCube under the moniker Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, which was released to Japanese audiences in December 2001, and international gamers in quarter 1 2002. As with its predecessor, most people have only played the GameCube version of Sonic Adventure 2, though the Dreamcast version doesn't seem to have as much of a cult following as the analogous version of Adventure 1. Just a few months after the release of Sonic Generations, a digital version of Sonic Adventure 2 was released for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC. Like with its predecessor, I sat down and completed all three versions of Sonic Adventure 2. As with the first game, I want to focus on one simple question. How will the Sonic Adventure 2 battle and its digital re-release update the original SA2 experience for newer generations of hardware. This is Sonic Adventure 2 Remake or Rebreak. Honestly, compared to Sonic Adventure 1, there's not nearly as much to talk about. Because SA2 Battle was ported to the GameCube within a year after the original version, it's much more of a straight porting job than DX was. Nevertheless, there are some differences that are worth covering in this video. The first thing you'll likely notice is the addition of a new intro cutscene before the title screen, which depicts Sonic and Shadow butting heads in Radical Highway. In terms of graphics, we're dealing with largely the same character model models, textures, animations, and level geometry is the original game. While I think the texturing on Shadow's head could have used some touching up on the GameCube, I think I can live without it. Like with DX Director's Cut, the texture draw distance has seen a nice improvement on the GameCube, which makes for an overall crisper image. The only thing that might be considered a step backward is the character lighting. In some scenes, Knuckles' muzzle looks like he's been sun tanning or something. Still, it's pretty minor, and I'm sure that most people wouldn't notice. Like with the original, I would agree with Turnabout Gaming that the Dreamcast version has slightly better control due to the better analog technology. Regardless, it's not a significant difference, and I find that the battle version still handles just fine. One thing I forgot to mention about the Dreamcast version is that Big the Cat actually makes quite a few cameo appearances. I like to think that he's still searching for the damn frog and once again got himself tangled up in the larger plot by pure accident. One of the strangest changes to Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, then, is that Big the Cat can no longer be found in stages, though he will still show up during some cutscenes if you mash the A button. When it comes to the presentation, there are two things that are noticeably different. First, if you have an ear for sound design, you might notice that the music has been turned up by about 6 decibels during cutscenes, which makes the dialogue a little more difficult to make out sometimes. Honestly though, it's not something I ever would have noticed if other people hadn't told me to listen for it. Speaking of dialogue, it's also worth noting that Sonic Team has once again not bothered to lip sync the English voice acting. I accepted it in the original game, seeing as it looked mostly convincing to begin with, but if they were going to bother to re-release the game on a more powerful system and change up a bunch of other things, why couldn't they have taken some time to fix the lip syncing too? What is significantly different in the remake, however, is that some cutscenes have been altered. One thing that's always bugged me about Sonic Adventure 2 Battle since my very first playthrough in 2004 is this one cutscene right here, where Rouge tricks Eggman into giving her the password to the Space Colony Control so she can use the main computer to research Project Shadow. What she finds surprises her, but when she spots Sonic and company via security camera, she suddenly decides that she's 
she's gonna go grab Master Emerald shards instead. I always found the sudden tonal shift in this cutscene kind of awkward, but little did I know that this is only a problem in the GameCube version. In the Dreamcast version, not only do we catch a quick glimpse of the bio lizard in the Project Shadow data file, but Rouge also gets a sudden message telling her about the Master Emerald shards rather than a security taping of Sonic and company. Suddenly, her dialogue makes a lot more sense. Another instance of the cutscenes being altered is the final scene in the Dark scenario, where Eggman puts the yellow Chaos Emerald into the Eclipse Cannon and activates Professor Gerald's secret protocol. In the Dreamcast version, the computer readout says Danger, while in the GameCube version, it says Warning. While that's all the changes I was able to notice during my playthroughs, I'm nonetheless baffled as to why they were made. The most important and widely known change to Sonic Adventure 2 Battle over the original game, however, relates to the multiplayer. Unfortunately, I only own one Dreamcast controller, so I have no way of playing or recording the original multiplayer mode. Thanks to Sonic Retro, however, I have a pretty good idea of what was changed. The biggest improvement is that all the characters from the original game are unlocked right from the start, whereas in the original game you had to grind A ranks as a specific character to unlock them all. Big the Cat has been removed as a player character from the original game, replaced with Dark Chow in the remake, and Battle also allows you to pit hero and dark characters against characters from the same alignment. Battle also allows you to fiddle with match settings, such as handicaps and time limits, whereas in the original you had to play three stages in a row for a single match. On top of this, the GameCube re-release introduces a few new stages and adds a few new stage types as well. Honestly, I don't think I have to play the Dreamcast multiplayer to know that the GameCube is better. More stages, more modes, more settings, more characters available right from the start, etc. As far as I can gather, most Sonic fans consider Sonic Adventure 2 Battle the best multiplayer experience in the entire Sonic series. Not that it really has that much competition for that title, but still something it has going for it. If you're a fan of multiplayer versus games looking for a good Sonic game, I don't think you can go wrong with picking up Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. So remake or rebreak? What's the verdict? I'd call Sonic Adventure 2 Battle a remake, but not by a huge margin. Like with DX Director's Cut, I feel like Sonic Team could have gone the extra mile here to make this game that much better. They could have fixed the radar in the treasure hunting stages, they could have made some of the A ranks a little easier to get instead of actually making them harder, they could have fixed up the texturing in Shadow's head, etc. There are also some minor drawbacks to this version, such as the slightly gimped sound mixing, the slightly worse lighting, the removal of big stage cameos, those odd changes to that one Rouge cutscene that caused it to make no sense, etc. None of these small quibbles are nearly enough to make Battle feel like a poor version of Sonic Adventure 2, but you've still gotta wonder why these problems are here when everything was fine and dandy on the Dreamcast. At the end of the day though, I still consider this the better version, if only for the slightly cleaner visuals and the better multiplayer. Battle also adds an exclamation point to the treasure hunting stages to help you find buried MacGuffins. Regardless, I'll totally understand if other people prefer the Dreamcast version. That leaves us with the digital version, which seems to be most people's least preferred way of playing Sonic Adventure 2. Let's start with the biggest positive. Sonic Adventure 2 now brandishes HD widescreen, and this game has never looked better. They even put a filter on Shadow's head textures to make his character model look a little nicer, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Some of the assets were clearly not meant to be viewed in HD. For example, in this cutscene you can see the seam in the skybox texture. That seems like something that could have easily been fixed. Another caveat is that the aspect ratio is rather inconsistent during during cutscenes. Most of them are in 16x9, like the main gameplay, while the ones with fancy digital effects are still in 4x3. I'm sure there was a good technical reason for doing this, but it's still kind of distracting. Overall though, I consider the digital re-release of Sonic Adventure 2 to be a nice visual upgrade over the previous two versions. In terms of presentation, the audio level of music during cutscenes has gone from a little louder than it should be, to ear blaring. Wait for me, okay Sonic? I'm on my while the lip syncing still doesn't match the English dialogue. You'd think that by 2012, Sonic Team would understand how sound mixing and lip syncing works, but I guess they couldn't be arsed to fix it for this port. The biggest drawback to the digital version, however, is that some of the features of previous versions don't come with the main game. You have to purchase the multiplayer in the boss rush mode as DLC. I personally don't care about those features that much, but I'm sure most people would rather just pay one price for everything. The last thing worth mentioning is technical issues. My pal and YouTube colleague Ryan Mathis has told me on several occasions that the controls and collision detection both took a hit when Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 made the transition from GameCube to 7th gen systems. Well, I'm playing both games right now, and honestly, 
I don't see what he's seeing. Sonic Adventure 2 controls just as well as it did on the GameCube, and I personally never ran into any collision detection issues during my playthroughs. Maybe it is worse, maybe it isn't, but I'm not finding any evidence for it being worse. In conclusion, I called the digital version of Sonic Adventure 2 a remake. The audio balancing and lip syncing issues really should have been fixed by this point, the multiplayer shouldn't have been DLC, the treasure hunting radar still hasn't been improved, and all the minor drawbacks from the GameCube version are still present here, though some of Big the Cat's stage cameos have been reintroduced. Like the analogous version of Adventure 1, it feels like Sega was more interested in throwing this game together to make a quick buck than they were in updating Sonic Adventure 2 for the ages to make it more timeless. I do think the HD widescreen is a major plus, but even that gets temperamental during cutscenes. Like with the other digital version, I still think it's worth the low price of admission if you're interested in the game and don't own anything else to play it on. And with that, I think I've covered everything there is to say about the Dreamcast era. Overall, it leaves a mixed legacy to say the least, and I understand why some people really hate these games while others really enjoy them. They have some technical problems, the story presentation often doesn't hold up, some of the gameplay styles leave a lot to be desired, and their problems only become more apparent with age. The Dreamcast era titles have certainly become dated, but are they truly among the worst games in the series as some people suggest? I'd say no for three reasons. First, many of the popular criticisms of these games, such as the story presentation in Adventure 1, the linearity of levels in Adventure 2, and the supposedly slippery control in Heroes, are made out to be much bigger problems than they really are. Second, while the games may have become dated, they've only aged about as much as many other classics of their time, such as Resident Evil, Final Fantasy 7, and Star Fox 64. Aging is still aging, but it does make you wonder why people treat those games differently. Third, and most importantly, many of the people who don't like these games dislike them because they're not a fan of the multiple gameplay styles as a matter of personal subjective taste. It's fine if you personally don't like mech shooting, treasure hunting, or even romping around stages in groups of three. It's also fine if you find Sonic at his most enjoyable in 2D with open-ended level design and simple mechanics. But when these playstyles are evaluated objectively on general standards of what makes Sonic fun to play, almost all of them check the right boxes and offer a good time. What I'm getting at here is that there are perfectly legitimate reasons beyond nostalgia as to why Dreamcastians, or any other Sonic fan for that matter, can enjoy Sonic Adventure, Sonic Adventure 2, and Sonic Heroes. And that's because these people approached them without classic purist expectations and evaluated them for what they were rather than complaining about all the ways they weren't like the games before. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Classic prejudice is rampant among the older members of the Sonic community and it's just as evident when they lambast the Dreamcast era as it is when they overglorify the classic era by pretending those games have no flaws. Whether you like or dislike these games is a matter of personal opinion to decide for yourself, but the shaming and dehumanization of people who still like them needs to stop. Until next time, I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed this marathon.